What's up, everybody, and welcome to a Tuesday edition of the Raiders Talk podcast. And as part of our ongoing series on the Raiders draft class, we're doing a deep dive on June 23rd into South Carolina wide receiver Brian Edwards. And if you've listened to these podcasts for a while, there's no secret that uh, myself, Scott Bear, and my co-host, Josh Schrock, uh, we really appreciate Brian Edwards' game. That is the tamest way to put it. Another way would, you know, it would be just to say that we absolutely love uh, the way this guy plays football, and that's why I was so excited to to talk to our feature guest, uh, uh, Ben um, Briner of the State Newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, lots of good insight, but this is one uh, this deep dive that I think you and I have been looking forward to. Absolutely. I mean, it's a guy that. We both picked as a as a draft sleeper, and they actually took him, so he felt a little bit smart. Yeah, and uh, we love the way he plays. He's big, physical. Like we both projected him to be uh, a key receiver for for many years to come. So I'm I'm excited to hear what Ben has to say. Sure. Well, let's get right to it. Our feature interview with Ben Briner of the State. Our feature guest on this week's Raiders Talk podcast is Ben Briner, South Carolina beat writer for the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. And he's going to help us take our deep dive into Brian Edwards' career with the Gamecocks and what um, he could project to do in the NFL. So, uh, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time. And my first question to you is this. Uh, what was your reaction when you saw him go to the Raiders and go to the Raiders in the third round? Because it seemed like there was a wide range of where, of where he uh, could have been taken. Um, I thought it was uh, maybe a little not, – not too much earlier than I expected. Um, it, it was kind of hard to tell because – um, he maybe isn't as much the highest ceiling type player, but he's very solid. And so kind of watching the, the pre-draft process, I wondered kind of, could he climb his way into the, into the second round? Or was he going to be, you know, would he maybe slip a little bit more depending on kind of the injury situation? Um, so I think it was maybe a hint earlier than I expected, but, but really not all that much earlier. Ben, you talk about the pre-draft process, and it was reported the Raiders had a first-round grade on Brian Edwards. Is that is that something that surprises you? I mean, you've seen this guy play a lot. Does he have first-round talent in your mind, or is that is that a little little overshooting? Um, I think that one could definitely see sort of first-round talent. It kind of d depended if you were looking for you know that kind of high-ceiling, explosive athlete, or a little bit more of kind of a strong, big-bodied leaper type. Um, you know. I tend to think that, that maybe your more really high-end explosive guys go a little bit earlier. So that surprised me a little bit. But, you know, it's the NFL draft, and it really kind of comes down to it, it only takes one person to be sort of enamored with a player to to get that kind of grade. And he had that foot injury right as he was training for the, for the NFL scouting combine. That's never a good time to get hurt, especially considering how weird this offseason has been with basically no um, – no opportunities for pro days or, or, or anything like that. Uh, how much of a setback uh, was that? And, and is there any kind of updates that, that maybe you could give us um, about his timetable for uh, getting back to 100%? Well, based on the fact that he got injured kind of, you know, as long ago as he did, he, I think it was, um, it was like a knee and then a foot. Mm -hmm. um, I'd assume that he probably should be, you know, rounding into form by the time, you know, games actually get, get going. I mean, it feels like forever ago. Shoot, I, I think the day yeah. he broke his foot, uh, we were at a board meeting, which means that that was a time we could still see people face to face. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's been a bit. Um, I think that him not being able to do that pre-draft stuff, I think it was not exactly limiting, but I think that it, it definitely uh, obscures some things sort of about his game because, you know, coming into the pre-draft process, kind of the biggest question was his sort of top end speed. Like he's, he's a big, strong physical receiver and he was definitely college fast, but the question was, you know, is he impactful NFL fast? And we just don't a hundred percent know. I mean, he, he's still a guy who could outrun some guys on Alabama. So he certainly isn't slow, but you know, he also played alongside a guy like Debo Samuel, uh, who's with the Niners now. And Debo is, I think, just short of a, just below a four five. Mm -hmm. And I think Brian's probably not quite at that level. 
Yeah, you, you mentioned Debo Samuel. How would you compare those two having watched both of them play? Well, I think Debo was more of kind of he's, – he's a little smaller, and it was sort of – the things that Debo could do well – were sort of – if he could do stuff that Brian could do, it was a little bit surprising. Like, he, he could win jump balls better than his height would indicate, but, you know, it, that's the kind of thing that might not necessarily translate when he gets kind of onto the next level. Um, what was interesting was that Edwards ended up taking over a lot of the stuff that Debo sort of did last season. He took a few more of the jet sweeps. He was kind of that main target. And he could do those pretty well on the college level – and a lot of what I'm going to be sort of interested in is, you know, does the speed and the strength that he showed off on, you know, in Columbia, how much does that translate when the athletes sort of around him are, are kind of bigger and stronger? Um, I, I, I will also say that uh, Brian, very good route runner, very kind of good at feeling the defense and honestly might be even a little better than Debo was at that. Uh, and it, Right, uh, right after he was taken um, by the Raiders, we got him on a on, on a, a conference call, and he said that he felt like he was he was slept on during the, just in terms of his his, his draft prospects, and uh, and I, I was just curious if you kind of uh, felt that to to uh, to uh, be the case, and also is he the type of player and personality who would use that as that you know chip on the shoulder um, fuel to the fire type of thing. Um, I think he is that kind of uh, that kind of personality. He definitely is. Um, he, he's at least when you know when you talk to him in interview settings, he's he's a very matter of fact kind of guy. He's very uh, plain spoken, very direct. Um, do I think he's been slept on in the draft process? Um, may, maybe a little, but probably not all that much. I mean, you know, he's 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 a big bodied, powerful receiver, and he's really been that. You know since he first got on campus. He, the, the Brian Edwards you saw his freshman year um, was, you know, not as good as the Brian Edwards you saw last season, but was definitely very polished, very, very college ready. I think uh, he had a uh, hundred yards in his first college game. And I don't know if it made sports center, but at least one sports center worthy catch mm -hmm. sports center type catch. <laughs> um, so he kind of arrived ready to roll and was just sort of this solid, consistent presence through some, uh, you know, very shifting uh, sort of situations across four seasons. What, what was the most impressive part of his game, and how did he how did he grow and mature as a receiver throughout his time in South Carolina with relatively shaky quarterback play? I'd say the most impressive part of his game is just his ability to get jump balls, his ability to go up against smaller corners box them out, or if he doesn't box them out, just pluck the ball from right over them. Um, he had, I can't, I can't remember which game this year, but maybe it was Georgia. In one of the games, he had a play that it wasn't even a touchdown because he didn't get his foot down, but, you know, they call it incomplete and you flipped on the replay and just saw sort of the strength of these hands to kind of grip this ball that he had absolutely no business catching. And, you know, he was good for, you know, at least one of those kind of tough catches at least every other game. Um, in terms of what sort of developed in, in him as a receiver was sort of being able to do a little bit of everything because when, uh, when Debo Samuel got hurt uh, in Edwards' sophomore year, he ends up being forced to slide in as that number one receiver. And if you look at the stuff that he was being asked to do and the stuff that he could do then, and then you watched him again, become the number one receiver last year, you know, stuff like screens, stuff like those jet sweeps, stuff like just, you know, the feel for getting open on intermediate routes, you definitely saw sort of a step forward. And he was sort of in an interesting role last year where instead of pairing with a senior quarterback, like he was supposed to, he ends up being the top target for a true freshman who's very much thrown into the fire. And so his role and his responsibilities, I think, shifted a little bit kind of because of that. Yeah, and you, you, you kind of mentioned it there at, at the end of that answer, just in terms of his shorter or, or his, his intermediate routes. Um, how, like, how is he there? Because the, the Raiders still run a variation of, of a West Coast scheme where the ball doesn't travel um, um, in the air. Uh, 
consistently far? Uh, how is he uh, in that aspect of his game? I would say he's, he's pretty good. Um, the first scheme that he was in uh, the, the first two years, they often kind of liked to, to use him as sort of a, a shorter receiver. They would run him on these uh, like three, four yard snag routes and just kind of, if he was there, dump the ball, have him fight forward, you know, get three, four five yards. Um, they tended to, to like doing that, to use him as sort of that consistent presence. He, I think he got better as kind of a yards after the catch guy. He's of, of those uh, three receivers the Raiders took. He's probably not going to, he's probably not at the level of the other two, but he's got some fight to him and he's, you know, he, he's got sort of that chain moving ability, that ability to kind of, you know, go five, six, seven yards on a hitch and then just box someone out. Ben, you've, you've obviously seen a lot of talented wide receivers in the SEC, all of Alabama's stars. South Carolina plays Clemson every year. How does Brian Edwards compare to the Henry Ruggs, the Justin Rosses, the T. Higgins that you've seen? Um, I don't know that I'd put him quite in that camp because, I mean, Lord knows there have been, you know, even just at the time that I've been at South Carolina and looking back a few years, there have been just a lot of dudes. I think one thing that is somewhat notable is that uh, obviously he played four years, unlike uh, some of the others at South Carolina, but he did set uh, most of the career receiving records, which is, is no small feat. Um, I don't necessarily know that he's quite at the level of those, those Alabama kids or those Clemson kids, just because they're, you know, so fast, a lot of them, but I think he's very strongly in sort of that next tier that, um, you know, really solid, going to give you good play all the time. I, I think sort of that kind of level. Now that he's, uh, now that he's, his college um, time is done, how do you evaluate his legacy um, with, 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 with the University of, of South um, uh, Carolina? Uh, just given that, you know, that he was that steadying presence and obviously a strong um, allegiance to the school, um, where do you think he falls in terms of, in terms of the legacy that he left? I think that uh, if you want to talk about something that's slept on, I think that his legacy is going to be possibly in the short term slept on a little bit, just because I tend to feel like legacies are often defined by your highest point and your last point. Mm -hmm. And his last point was this season that did not go well for them. And his highest point was either this season or maybe stepping in for Samuel as a sophomore. But I think that he delivered, you know, just very good, consistent play. He gets, you know, thrown to the fire as a freshman. He gets thrown to the number one spot as a sophomore. Uh, last year, he had a knee injury that he, he gutted through. I mean, if you watch, if you can find tape of the Appalachian State game, he was going out there and going after balls and making some key plays. And then as soon as the whistle blew, uh, you know, he was walking in a manner that you thought, how on earth can that guy run? He was limping so bad. And then he would go back out there, load up again, and, you know, get after it. So I think his legacy is going to have been, you know, a solid, strong player throughout. He might not have had the highs of a Pharaoh Cooper or an Alshon Jeffrey, but he was always there. He was always consistent. And he was part of this sort of mini run. And I think as people get further away from this season, sort of the respect and memory of him is kind of going to grow. Well, Ben, thank you so much for the time for kind of helping us kind of break down everything about uh, about Brian Edwards and his, you know, college tenure and how he's going to uh, uh, project into the pros. Uh, if you guys want to follow him, it's at Briner the State. Ben Briner, thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a ton to Ben Briner from the state for breaking down Brian Edwards' legacy at the University of South Carolina and you know, I think that we both kind of learned a lot about, about, you know, Ben's take on, 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 on Brian Edwards, the impact of the injury. Uh, what was, what was uh, one of your takeaways uh, from that uh, enlightening interview? Yeah, I think the first thing that, that Ben said that stood out to me was the fact that South Carolina, the way they use Brian Edwards is probably how the Raiders envision using him. You know, a lot of inter intermediate routes, slants, drags, uh, you know, just little ways to get the ball in his hands and, and move the chains, right? They have, the Raiders now have a big play guy, Henry Ruggs, 
And while Brian Edwards, you know, I'm sure they're, they're going to send him vertical. He's a, he's a good 50-50 jump ball guy. His main purpose whenever he gets on the field is going to be move the chains, you know, uh, a big a big slot guy, probably a red zone target, uh, stuff like that. So I think seeing Raiders fans can probably look to how South Carolina used Brian Edwards to get a sense of how John Gruden will as well. Yeah, and uh, I think that that's important as you try to, to translate and, and – uh project what this guy can do in the pros and really how he fits within the scheme of your offense, because that is the most important thing to John Gruden. And the theme of this draft class is about fits more than anything else. And maybe they could see, all right, we can work this guy on, on those, in, on those intermediate routes where I think lots of fans, they go to YouTube, right. Um, and they look on the highlights and they just see him bombing down 40 yards downfield and, and out and out muscling guys. But I, I, I think it's a positive that he can do uh, a number of different things that the Raiders like to do. The one thing that I kind of noticed, and this is, what is this now? This is our fourth kind of um, deep dive into a uh, Raiders draft pick. And granted, a lot of them were, were taken higher, but you just – it was about heaping praise, right? And I really thought that Ben was very measured in his analysis of like of a guy that we both love, right? And I think that that's a positive because it it paints an accurate picture of what Raiders fans are getting. That yes, this guy can do a lot of good stuff, but there are some things to prove, especially as he pointed out in terms of his uh, top end speed. And while he was able to create separation and out muscle even SEC defensive backs, can you do that against NFL defensive backs and the speed of the NFL game, that that's something that he's going to need to prove and uh, something that I'm sure he's looking forward to being able to prove after, again, what what he told us right after the uh, draft was that he really felt slept on. He really felt ignored um, in comparison to, to some of his other uh, you know, entrance in the, into the NFL draft playing his same uh, position. It's one thing to um, for to the Raiders to have a, a first round grade on him, right? And then he goes in the third round. What I thought what Ben was saying was was important, which is he's really talented, but the foot injury, the foot break he had, right? That probably hampered teams to build, including the Raiders, to really see this guy's true potential, his true top end speed. And Ben gave us a really complete picture of a guy who is really talented can do a lot of things. Like you mentioned, he stepped in for Debo Samuel, a guy who, you know, people in the Bay Area obviously know what he, what he can do. And Brian Edwards took that role, jet sweep screen. So he, he's very versatile, but there are questions about the top end speed. He can beat some Alabama corners. Maybe he can't beat some Alabama corners. So I think we got a, a very complete picture of a guy whose future we both are very high on, but might take some time to fully develop into what the Raiders want him to be. Yeah. And it's, it's been, I mean, it's June already, right? It's just, Groundhog Day for everybody. So time just kind of exists in a vacuum. The sun goes up the sun, and the sun goes down. Uh, but it's been a long time since he hurt his foot and he never got a chance to run a 40. He never got a chance to show what, what, what he could do at the Combine or at South Carolina's Pro Day. And that's obviously a disappointment and kind of a dovetailing on what you were talking about. But you would think maybe with that volume of time that he could be he could hit the ground running when, when, when the Raiders report to training camp it, as it's currently scheduled at the end of next month. But it's a foot injury, right? Those things are tricky. And if we're talking about top end speed, right, and you got a foot injury that, that, uh, that um, there was a break or a fracture in, does that slow him down just a little bit, right? Could that mitigate his 2020 impact um, as he tries to integrate himself into what the Raiders are doing. I think that's definitely possible, especially because they have um, a lot of depth now at his uh, position. Boy, we've talked about it before, right? I think having Tyrell Williams, Henry Ruggs, Nelson Aguilar, all these weapons now, the pressure is not there on a guy like Brian Edwards to come in and, and absolutely blow the doors off John Gruden to put him in the lineup. He can take time to get his foot healed up, make sure it's healed properly. Cause like you said, foot injuries are really tricky, especially with receivers. There's always setbacks. There's, you know, all sorts of stuff. So it's important that he is, is fully healthy before he steps on the field. And I think having Tyrell Williams, uh, a veteran guy who, who we think, you know, him and Brian Edwards are going to play the same spot, right? They're going to be the, the X, uh, the possession receiver. I think having, having that guy there, Tyrell, having Tyrell there will, will take the pressure off Brian Edwards to feel like he has to come in immediately and, and make an impact. Yeah. And, and Tyrell is going to be 
supremely motivated for two reasons. Number one, his first his first season playing for a team in uh, in in Oakland where he has family ties obviously didn't go very well, right? That he was hurt early, and I think fans were ultimately disappointed by by the uh, production that he had, even though it wasn't necessarily his fault, as John Gruden said time and time again, his feet were on fire, that it was a bigger problem than Tyrell was letting on. Uh, At the same time, right, he's on his second season of a four-year, $44 million deal, right? And he's going to make eight figures. And who knows if he would be making eight eight figures if he was fully healthy because his contract was guaranteed for injury, but nothing else. Um, so maybe the Raiders could have cut him. So I think ultimately Tyrell wants to prove that he deserves the $11 million in 2021 also to continue, uh, you know, staying with this team. And if not, right, if he goes somewhere else, he's going to want to cash in, um, with, 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 uh, with some other teams. So Tyrell is going to be supremely motivated. I think that takes the pressure off of off of Brian Edwards, maybe not gives him a red shirt season, but maybe just allows him to develop and get comfortable in his role. I still think that uh, he's ultimately going to make some plays, um, you know, downfield, but Josh question though, I mean, keeping Edwards and having Tyrell Williams, does that make a lot of sense because their skill set seem somewhat similar? Yeah, I think it makes perfect sense because I, I think the way that we're going to see them use Brian Edwards, especially initially, is going to be, like I said, it's, it's going to be a big slot guy, a guy who can go across the middle on shorter routes and use his body to leverage defenders and move the chains. And you look at how the Raiders struggled on third down and in the red zone last year, they really miss that guy. They have Hunter Renfro in one slot, we know, and he's really effective. But if they can get a big body slot guy and still have Tyrell operate on the outside, I think that's going to make this offense way more dynamic. And I think the combination of the speed of rugs and the size and physicality of Brian Edwards is what the Raiders like so much is that you have, you're not putting all your eggs in this dynamic speed basket, right? You're getting a a guy who he's just going to be consistent, which is what Ben told us his entire South Carolina career. He was just consistent. That's why he's the top receiver in program history. Yeah. And I think that that's a good point is that you, to flesh out a wide receiver core that was decimated last year, to a point where you could look at this and you could, in in terms of continuity, right? John Gruden's going nowhere. Derek Carr up in the air. This is a big prove it year uh, for him. But in terms of continuity of your pass targets, look at what you got. You got Brian Edwards, who's going to sign a four-year deal, pretty cheap. Henry Ruggs, possibly a five-year deal uh, with that option on a rookie contract. Hunter Renfro, three more years on a rookie contract. Darren Waller, tied up for, I think, three more years um, after this. So you have continuity in the pattern, right? And when you evaluate that group, no matter who's throwing him the football, let's take that out of the equation. I think there's a level of, of appropriate optimism when you look at the diverse skill sets, Waller, Renfro, Edwards, Ruggs. In theory, that could be the Raiders, you know, um, receiving core including the tight end for a long time. Agreed. And you've got a, you got a group that has a wide array of skill sets, but all have the ability to make big plays. Brian Edwards was third in the country last year in broken tackles. So people can talk about his athleticism, but the guy is a tackle breaker. He's a guy who can make people miss. We know what Henry Ruggs capable of. I mean, we saw Henry, Hunter Renfro rip off two 60 plus yard touchdowns last year. Mm-hmm. So it's a group that has gotten more dynamic, more explosive. And if, you know, all the boxes are checked. That's a group, like you said, who's going to be around for the next four or five years, no matter who the quarterback is, which is, and, which is a big plus. Yeah. And, and speaking of who their quarterback is now, uh, Derek Carr, if, if, if you can earn his trust, mm-hmm. kind of like how Michael Crabtree did um, back when in 2015 and, and 2016, Derek Carr will straight up see that you're covered and throw you the ball anyway, if he mm-hmm. believes that you can come down with it. So back to this Brian Edwards topic is that I think if he can have some good days in July and August and maybe in one of those preseason games prove, hey, he can go up there and bring the ball down and that he can be aggressive and that he can um, kind of like take the ball away that I think that that's going to earn you targets from a guy like Derek Carr. If you 
if, if you screw him over, you're not going to see the ball again, right? He's not going to take the interception for you. But if it's 50-50 or maybe even 40-60, uh, Derek has shown in his history, even back in, in uh, 2016, a willingness to trust his receivers to make a play downfield, even if the throw isn't perfectly – um, advise um, necessarily. So I, I think that's where Brian Edwards can really come into this thing if he can earn some trust. And Hunter Renfro obviously has it. You know, Henry Ruggs, for as much as we talk about Speed Demon, man, you, you, you go back to that conversation with, uh, with Michael uh, Casagrande. That's another do everything guy. So I think this offense, you know, um, has a bright future. And if you're going to pay the offensive lineman all that money, you got to go cheap somewhere. And they went and they have a bunch of. Uh, you know, wideouts um, under a uh, rookie contract. So it's always tough to try to like make a bold prediction on stats. Cause you just never know how it's going to stick, but you know, we, you know, uh, uh, Ben was pretty measured in what Brian Edwards could do uh, his first year. Do you think it's appropriate for us to be measured in what we would expect? I mean, like what kind of numbers, you know, would, you know, like would, uh, you know, like, would you think would be, um, a positive year uh, for this guy. I think it's best. Let's just stick with the rule of under promise over perform, right? So let's yeah. think that Brian Edwards, maybe he comes in and, you know, it takes him six or seven games to really get under his belt. He's the fourth receiver, plays a red zone third down role, and then moves into a full-time role in 2021. So I think that's fair. I don't really have a catch number for you because I don't know what that looks like, how right. long years will go for wide. Uh, but I think it's it's best to – be very, very excited about his future prospects while being very measured for 2020. Yeah, and I also think that we're, we're talking about him as the fourth receiver, right? Yeah. I mean, look at where they were last year. They were, <laughs> they were acquiring guys in trade. They were putting Trevor Davis into the fire. They were yeah. throwing Zay Jones in a week after um, he got there to – lackluster uh, result but now we're talking about him as the number four guy and yeah. they're the, you're right the catch totals are going to be tough to predict because there's only one football and Darren Waller's gonna should get 90 of them right and yeah. so there's uh there's a lot of uh targets to go around so I do think it will be interesting even if he doesn't blow the doors off of anybody st uh, st statistically Maybe don't put them in your fantasy lineup, but I still think, and I think you and I both agree that this could be a guy to keep watching, watch for subtle signs of progress. And then maybe in 2021, when he's got a year under his belt, he's more healthy then maybe you see him truly um, explode into that receiver that I think you and I believe that he can be. Um, so that's definitely uh, an exciting prospect. I think this was another fun breakdown of a, of a Raiders draft pick that I think fans and us as journalists are dying to see on a practice field even. Yeah. Um, even that would be nice. Uh, not too much longer till that, maybe another month, and uh, maybe we'll actually get to see these guys practice if everything goes as scheduled. Josh, thank you so much. Thanks again to the state's Ben Briner. Again, at Briner the State on Twitter. Follow him. Lots of good stuff on uh, South Carolina. And he's written a lot of good stuff about Brian Edwards. So, Josh, thank you so much. We'll do this again on Friday. And the breakdown is going to be Louisiana Tech cornerback, uh, Amik Robertson. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. See you guys later.